guys, this is Meredith from the Witty Gritty Paper Co. And today we're going to be painting the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. Um, it actually also occurs, um, if you know of the phenomenon, it also occurs in the Southern Pole. So you could also technically call it the Southern Lights, but I'm just going to refer to it as the Northern Lights for our purposes. Now I just want to note quick before we start laying down color that I am working on a sheet of stretched watercolor paper. If you've watched my channel for any amount of time, you'll know that this isn't something I usually do. I know there are some artists out there that recommend you stretch your paper every time you're going to watercolor anything. Now, it's personally, I don't do that. I don't notice enough of a difference to do that for everything I paint. Um, but in this case, I did notice a difference. I did the painting a couple times. I experimented, and I found that stretching the paper really did help. So if you've never done it before, I would recommend maybe at least trying it for this technique. And if you don't like it, you know, you don't have to keep doing it. All right, so I'm going to start off with some ice green here and this is a liquid watercolor by Dr. P.H. Martin and I've got it on my one inch flat brush here. Now I really um, I really love the flat brush for this technique. First of all, we're going to begin by actually laying in the lights themselves. Now if you've ever seen the Aurora Borealis or you know seen pictures of them then you know that they're kind of wavy. Um, and if you want to grab a reference photo for this, that's totally fine. I actually would recommend it because um, I worked from one on my first couple tries. And we just want to lay in the lights. You kind of want them to look, like I said, like waves. And I really love the flat brush for this. You could do it with a round brush, but, um, but the flat brush is just easier to get this shape, I think. And I wouldn't be afraid here because this is um, this is going to get covered up, so don't be afraid to go darker. Um, I especially think that if you if you intensify the color near the bottom of the shapes, um, that'll help make them look more realistic as well. Um, I noticed that primarily the the colors of the Northern Lights and the Southern Lights. Um, tend to be like greens and pinks and purples. Um, I'm going to do mostly green and a little pink too. Um, but feel free to try those other colors. I'm sure it would look very, very cool. All right, pretty happy with that. I'm going to rinse out my brush and I'm going to go in with my three quarter inch flat brush, so slightly smaller. And I'm going to go in with some sunrise pink. And this is also a liquid watercolor by P.H. Martin, um, Dr. P.H. Martin. And if you don't have liquid watercolors, that's okay. I would just try the closest thing you have. Um, these are really almost neon watercolors, so they actually don't um, sort of turn up in my everyday watercolor palette, just because they're not very, they don't really occur in nature very much, um, the neons. So... If you don't have them, which again, they aren't exactly practical for most paintings. Um, if you don't have them, don't worry about it. Just use whatever you have is, that is um, closest. Talking really fast today, can you tell? <laughs> um, make sure when you do this that you don't let the colors bleed together. That would not, that would not be good. You can use the side of the flat brush too. Whatever you want to get that look. I would recommend, however, that you don't extend these lights, though, past, I would say, like three quarters down your paper. I would leave this bottom quarter blank because we're going to put in a horizon line. All right. I think that my pink needs to be a little bit more intense. And actually, a fun fact about the northern lights um, and the southern lights is it's actually solar winds. The Aurora Borealis are solar winds that are attracted to Earth's poles, that are attracted to the magnetism of the poles, and they collide with the atmosphere. And that's what makes them look this way. And it's just, I thought that was cool. Fun fact. Factoid for the day, impress your friends. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm gonna continue intensifying my color and I'm gonna let this dry and then we will be back. All right, guys, um, my first layer, my northern lights, is all dry, and I'm ready to go on to the next layer. Now, um, I've already got some blue out of my palette, and the color is Anthroquinone Blue by M. Graham. I know it's quite a mouthful. 
Um, and again, it's not important that you have the exact same color, just a dark blue. And um, what we're going to do here is we're going to glaze on top of the layer we've already put down. And I just want to clarify something because I feel like glazing is one of those terms that everybody hears, but um, they're not necessarily really sure what it means. Um, and I found the best way to think of it is like um, tinting photos or like using filters on photos on your phone. It's basically using a thin layer of color to, um, what do I want to say? I guess adjust the layer of color that is, that's already there, the pre-existing layer of color. So that's what this is. We're glazing this blue on top of the pink and green we've already put down. Now I'm going to use my smaller flat brush for this, but you can use your bigger one, whatever you want. Um, just make sure that you work wet enough and that you move fast because you really do want this to be pretty darn even or it will look a little strange. So you see how we're doing that? We're slowly sort of tinting the color we've already laid down. I'm sorry if there's a little camera shake. Sometimes my arm hits my tripod and the camera shakes. <laughs> Can't be too enthusiastic here. Now I'm going to extend this all the way down my lights. And again, I don't I really don't want it too dark. I just want it. I just want a glaze. I just want a tint. I don't want to completely get rid of that color that I put down to be the lights. And I did, I experimented a lot with this painting, um, different ways of doing it, different orders of layers, and this was the one that I liked the best. But I do, um, I do definitely encourage you to experiment with, um, with this painting. It's a, it's a very interesting subject matter. All right, now I'm rinsing off my flat brush a little, and the reason is I want a little bit, I want it to be paler where the sky meets the horizon. And I know I haven't put in my horizon line yet, but I know where I want it to be. So I'm just wetting the bottom using plain water here. And I'm just going to drop in a tiny bit more blue, not much. Just a little bit right along the bottom here. Because this, um, this would all be snow covered. So you don't want it to be too dark. It would reflect. It would be dark-ish because it's nighttime and it, would, um, it doesn't have light to reflect. So it's not nearly as white. But still, I want, I want it a little paler right here where the sky meets the horizon. All right. Now, this is right now on my paper. It's still wet. It's shiny wet and not puddle wet. Um, you'll probably hear me use that expression a lot in my videos. But um, it is a good sort of mile marker for how wet your paper is. And um, I'm using uh, Arches paper today. And the nice thing about higher quality papers, which Arches is, is that I find they, um, they actually keep your paint wet longer. Now, depending on what you're trying to do, this could be, you know, something you don't want. But in our case, it's something we do want. So, you know, you can just still try this. If all you have a student grade, I still want you to try, you know, make art. Don't let your supplies stand in your way. But at the same time, if you aren't sure what to use your artist paper for if you aren't sure if it's worth it. I would say if you want to do a lot of techniques that involve keeping your paper wet for some time, then Artist Grade is definitely going to help you with that. Okay, so I've mixed up some darker, some more intense, same color though, Anthroquinone Blue, and I've got it on my number eight round brush. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drop it in sort of in the areas in between my northern lights. Now I want to be careful. I don't want this paint to bloom out of control. So I'm just doing little dots at a time. Now this dark blue, this anthroquinone, it is a particularly um, sort of feisty color. It does really like to spread out and push into other colors. And I like that. That's what I want for this. Um, but if you want a little bit more control, I would just use like an ultramarine. Um, and you can experiment too. Different brands, different colors are going to be a little bit more lively, livelier and less livelier. But for my purposes, this is what I want. I want that color to explode up into these areas. 
Uh, it's just so cool. So cool. And again, make sure you do this while it's still wet or it will not, it will not work. And if you feel like you've lost some of your definition here, like these have gotten a little fuzzy, you can put it back in with your round brush with that tip. You can sort of right there, like I've um, sort of reinstalled the definition that I lost. When you work wet and wet, you can, that can happen a lot. You can lose definition. All right, I'm gonna finish this up and wait for it to dry and then we'll be back. Okay guys, my surface is all dry again and um, you probably noticed it looks quite a bit different than the last time you saw it. I, um, I darkened up the areas and just added a little bit more definition then I just let it dry naturally. I made sure not to mess with it when it was getting too dry. You can get um, those sort of cauliflower-like blooms if you mess with it when it's you know, not wet enough really anymore. So anyway, it's all dry and I'm ready to add my next element, which is the stars in the sky. And the great thing is since the Aurora Borealis are relatively transparent, you can do the stars right over the top. So you don't have to worry about, don't have to worry about the layering. So I've just squeezed out some of my white artist's acrylic ink. I've used this on the channel before. And um, it's usually in the calligraphy section of the art store. Um, so it's pretty easy to find. And I've got an old toothbrush here and I'm just saturating my toothbrush with that white ink. And before I start spritzing, there's one thing I'm going to need and that is a mask. So let me just go grab that right here. All right, here's my mask. It's just a piece of copy paper. And um, the reason I use this is because I don't want to get these stars, these white specks, I don't want to get them down in my horizon. I want to preserve that. So I'm just going to put that on top of there. Just going to place it there. No need to tape it down or anything. And I'm going to take my finger and sort of flick it across the bristles of my toothbrush. And depending on how much ink you have on there and how close you're spritzing to the paper, um, will depend on how big your little specks end up being. I don't, I don't like mine to be just one size. I like a lot of sizes. I think it looks more realistic. I think it looks more like stars. And also be forewarned that this will get all over the place. It'll get on you. It'll get on your table. So I don't care if it gets on my table, but uh, if you care, make sure you keep that in mind before you start. Oh, I love that. This is just such a fun touch to add. And actually too, um, the people who look at your painting, they might think that this looks more like falling snow than stars, but either way it's appropriate because this is the Arctic. <laughs> so, so that is a added bonus. All right. I like the way this looks. And again, you can add as many, um, many or as few stars as you like. And I think I'm just about happy with this. It looks especially good in these really dark areas. It really stands out. All right. Looking good. All right, I'm just going to go wash off my finger here and we'll be right back. All right, guys, I'm on to my very last step here. And all I have to do is add in my tree line at the horizon. And on my palette, I've got a mix of dark blue and black. Um, but any cool gray will work too. Just make sure that it is the darkest color on the painting so that it shows up the best. And I've got it in two shades here. I've got a lighter shade and a darker shade because I want my farther trees to be lighter and paler since they're receding. And I want my trees that are the closest to be the, um, the darkest. All right, so I like my horizon line to go all the way across the painting. But this is completely up to you whatever looks right to your eye I'm just gonna dab them in I'm really utilizing the um, little point on my number six round brush here I encourage you to take your time with this part it really um, really frames the piece if you do it nice and steady I also find that holding my brush sideways can really help me get a nice, more random look. 
This is a really simple stroke. There's really no trick to it. It's just up and down with my pointy round brush. I do think though that the longer your round brush is, the better this works. All right, now I've got my far away tree line in. I'm just gonna do a couple dark trees right up close, just to really bring the viewer into the piece, make it more three-dimensional. Same mix of dark blue and black, but like I said, you know, any cool gray or just plain black will work. And same brush. And I'm gonna do a few that are, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start high, cause these are close. So I'm gonna do a few that are really thick. I'm just flicking my round brush down to get them, to get the sort of coniferous pine needle look. Just sort of flicking it down, and I'm really taking advantage of the texture of the paper here too. That helps my trees look all bushy and natural. I'll add, can add a few more. You can make them bigger, smaller. You can do lots of them. I like I like a few just to just to frame it. Do a little one next to him. You do a couple that are a little bit more scraggly, if you like. I think that adds a lot of character if you do ones that aren't as perfect. And um, things usually better, or sorry, <laughs> things usually look better in odd numbers. So like three trees or five trees, the less, um, the less pattern there is, the more it looks like it really happened in nature. Repeating patterns are very rare in nature. I'm gonna do one more bushy one on this side, just to sort of frame it. And if you want to, you can sort of paint your pine needles with little pockets left in between and it'll look like snow on the branches. Your eye sort of fills that in for you. All right, I think I'm gonna call that done. Just let it dry and then we'll take off our masking tape and see how it looks. All right guys, here's the finished painting. I zoomed in a little so that you could see it better. And I just love the way this turned out. Um, all I have left to do is take off the masking here. And masking tape comes off super easily from 100% cotton paper, let me just let me just say that <laughs> it's kind of awesome. It doesn't doesn't pull off the paper or pill it at all. So another perk to artist grade paper for this. All right. So here's our finished piece. And um, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you liked this video. And if you did, please give me a thumbs up. It really helps out the channel. And um, leave a comment if you have any questions or you just want to say hi, <laughs> that's what it's there for. And um, there are links at the end of the video to places you can find more of my work and you can connect with me on social media, all that jazz. So thank you again for watching. Um, happy painting. Mm -hmm.